Welcome to Strip Cover Lit. I'm Adrian Fort. And I'm Dalton Gentry. And we are here with a reader's review over Ernest Hemingway's short story, Hills Like White Elephants. Any place you want to start? Where can you start with Hemingway? I mean, I think much like our writer's workshop on Hemingway, which you should watch, which you should definitely watch, uh, there's just so much to speak about with Hemingway. Um, I think a little less intensive now that we're not discussing the writing, but the reader's interpretation. But overall... So, I, so let's start there. What stood out to you? What stood out to me? Again, it really comes down to... It's so clean. It's so crisp. Right. I think and the thing, it's so short as well as that's very surprising, is I could sit down any day of the week and just read this in one sitting. And whether I get everything from it or not, I enjoy it. I could look at it a year from now and find something completely different from it. That's a good point, especially in the reader's review. Um, the rereadability mm -hmm. of Hemingway is massive. Um, I mean, ballpark, how many times do you think you've actually read Hills Like White Elephants? Well, I probably read it ten times as an undergraduate for class. <laughs> Every class has Hills. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but that's the thing, it's ten minutes? Just to sit and read it? If that yeah. is, depending on your reading speed, of course, but it, it's nothing. It's a quick read. But there's so much depth behind the words. Absolutely. Um, and it's a quick read. If you take it to read it, if you take it to savor it, and it's, Hemingway's short stories are like a meal. Do you sit down and wolf it down, or do you do you make a meal out of it? And especially ones like this, I mean, like we said last time, what is this? Uh, maybe a thousand words, probably something like that. Probably I should close. It's them. not long at all. You could you you can stretch this out as a reader, but. What are some things that you have brought into this the separate times that you've read it? Can you think of anything? Well, I know specifically, and we discussed this quite a bit in the uh, Writer's Workshop video, if you'd like to give that a look. Uh, you know, the first time I read it, I got nothing from it. Right. Uh, then I, you know, read it again, and I, I found out, you know, about the uh, abortion part of it. It made a little more sense to me, and then I felt like the story had more depth, and I enjoyed it. Uh, when I read it this time around, the most recent time around, it really, the, the emotional appeal of Jig really caught me this time. Where right. uh, he, One of my quotes that I mentioned in our Six Hemingway Quotes video, she says to the American that if she does this, or she goes through with the abortion, then things will be nice again. Uh, things will, when she says that things are like hills, or, <laughs> excuse me, when the hills are like white elephants, uh, it, it'll be nice. And that really resonated with me. And maybe at one point in my life when I read this in college, I didn't have that emotional uh, draw to it, but it just seems like every time that you look at this novel, it grows. this short story, excuse me, it grows. There's something different, and it always changes, which is amazing as a writer to be able to encapsulate this. Well, and, and just a small thing with what you said there, she, uh, it, it's not that it will be nice, mm -hmm. it's that I'll say it and it will yes. be nice, which infers that at one point in time in this relationship it was. Yes. What point in time was that? And that's the thing. With Hemingway, you don't know. But you do. But you, you don't, do. You don't know the timeline, but you know the relationship timeline. And that's this amazing is when he was, to have. This is when he was courting her. Yes. That he would give her so much credit for being witty, for being funny. And what kills me about this is, again, it's such a short read, but we know so much about these characters just from what they're saying. Yeah. Uh, we understand their relationship. We understand the point that we're, the relationship they're in. And that might be the you know inevitable ebb and flow of any relationship to yeah. get to a point like this, but it connects with the reader. Yeah, I've dated this woman. You've, yeah, everybody's dated this woman. Yeah. Uh, this woman is willing to do anything to please him. Uh, to a point, but she wants things to be as romantic and magical as they were when they first got together. See, I don't even think the romance is the point. Really? Romance isn't there. It's fun. Things will be nice. 
we'll see that I, I'm interpreting it completely different then. I'm not seeing that, you know, it will be nice, it will be fun. I'm seeing that as things will go back to what they were. Right, but what were they? I, I think it, it doesn't have to be just, you know, the fun, the nice, the going out, the trying new things, the drinks. Those are all just a part of the overall relationship that they're describing. Well, I yeah, but, but like we said earlier, mm -hmm. this is the side piece. Yes. I don't think things were ever romantic. I don't think things were ever particularly promising. She is referred to as the girl. He is referred to as the American, which means to me two things. One, that he is older. Two, that this relationship is very young. I, I would agree with the relationship being very young. I, it clearly reads as this is a traveler who has come to, we'd assume, some part of Europe that Hemingway had spent time in, and he has met this woman there. That's why he is referred to specifically as the American, because that distinguishes him. Right. I, I don't know that he is necessarily a traveler. This could be business. It could be. He could be, um, he could be going to France every month on business. Yes. Uh, Mexico, Spain, wherever it is. Um, that could be some place that he's going periodically. And this is the side piece in Spain. Yes. And he then has to go to the side piece in France. He's got to go to the side piece in, in, in Mexico. Um, it could be that this man has relocated and he is still new wherever they are, mm -hmm. right? He, he is the American. That is what is new and novel about him. And at the time when this was written, Americans, being the American, would have come with a certain set, uh, cachet in itself. Yes, yes. Right? Oh my, how times have changed. Right, yeah. Uh, <laughs> but uh, again, just the interpretation of the words allows this story to resonate differently with any reader, if that makes sense. Um, at one point, Jig says to him uh, he, something along the lines of, that's what we do now, or that's what we used to do. We try drinks. We try new things. That's all Which, we do, I think, is what That's it. all we do. Which, there's so many ways you could interpret that, and since Hemingway does not give you that uh, tag to explain how she's saying this, you don't know if there's disdain in that. You don't know if there's excitement. It could but, be read so many ways. Right. Well, and here's the, that's, that's one of the, the things that gives so much depth and rereadability to Hemingway is that when he doesn't tag it, you do. Yes. So wherever you are in life, you put that indelible stamp of you on the piece. And that's incredible to say that we could both read the exact same text. Uh, the readers out could uh, read their text. It's the same words. But every single person has got something different from this piece. Right. And that is absolutely amazing in any sense. Writing, literature, anything. To be able to touch that many people with the same thing. Do you want it with water? I don't know, the girl said. Do you want it with water? I don't know, the girl said. Do you want it with water? I don't know, the girl said. Right? I mean, just that. Uh, whatever you put the emphasis on, it changes everything. Wherever your emphasis is on whatever syllable. Oh, please never say that again. Thank okay, you. Okay, that's fine. Uh, but it, it, it is. It, no matter how you read it, and maybe that is, you know, you should read Hills Like White Elephants once a year and just see how it affects you because that really tells a lot about who you are at that point. Uh, what is your primary focus? How are you interpreting this relationship? Because I guarantee had I read this in college more, gotten more from it, it would have been completely different. It was completely different. I don't think it would have been possible to have read it as an undergrad anymore. You don't think so? I know. How often did we read it? I it, you did. You it had was at this least was once every a single semester. class. Once a semester you read Hills Like White Elephants. You schluffed it off and you didn't care about it because you know it. And then you wrote a paper on it anyhow. and you wrote the same paper every <laughs> time. And that's unfortunate that the uh, American education system has gotten to that point. That's not fair. You but, can't blame that on the American no, education system. No, you can't. Business, and that's post-education. Let's think of it this way. If you are yeah. teaching uh, an undergrad literature course, yeah. would you want them to read Hills Like White Elephants? Yeah. Yes, you would. Yeah. Because at that point in your life, when you're a tenured professor, this story has meant so much to you. It's We're going back to the same thing. Right. You want to give this to someone else. You want to share this piece with someone else. But it's impossible to share your interpretation of this piece with anyone. 
Yeah, it's it's almost impossible to share any interpretation of this piece with anyone. Yes. Um, down to the fact that most people don't even understand what it's about yeah. the first time around. Right? And I, I, I do believe, if I recall correctly, that there was a lot of trouble publishing this story when it first came out because nobody knew what it was about. And especially given the time period, I mean, they wouldn't immediately go, oh, that's abortion they're talking about. It was just so mysterious that it felt just like a, a scene. Really? Yeah. I, I never just this believe part. everything that I say, please. Don't look it up. Just believe it. That's how this relationship is going. <laughs> but uh, I, I could understand that. And had, I think, Hemingway came out and said, hey, Jig, why don't you get the abortion? That would have changed this piece completely. That would be the primary focus. And given the time period of publication, that would have took a lot away from this piece. A lot of people would have avoided that piece because of this. Right. And so I think the mystery is necessary. Well, I don't know that it's mystery. Mm -hmm. I think that on I think that at a reading level, it adds a lot to this story that it's never named, because it's like that scene in a movie where you have to work in the characters' names. It never feels natural, right? Because I don't sit here and say, Dalton Gentry, what are you doing? Yes. Right? And uh, Hemingway just completely avoids that whatsoever. He's like, I'm not going to give you any background. Here's two people. They're shitting in the train station. Let's talk. Going forward. Uh, again, you know, we talked about it in the Writer's Workshop video. He is unpacking his novel, but then he's cutting out what he's unpacked. He is leaving you the bare bones which I, I would say few authors actually are brave enough to do. Right, he unpacked the suitcase and just put the underwear back in. <laughs> it's a, that's a beautiful analogy. He's taking Thank the you. trip anyway. He's going anyway, he's running with it. But, I, I mean, what more can you say about this piece that would not only make sense to you, but make sense to someone else? Because this is such a personal piece for everyone. All of Hemingway is that way, I think. You think? Yeah. Um, even if you if you sit down with a group of Hemingway connoisseurs, everyone does the hipster thing when when you ask them what their favorite one is. Excuse me. Let me put my glasses back on. King of hipsters here. Um, so, like for me, my favorite Hemingway is The Last Good Country. Okay. Um, the only place I've ever seen it is in the complete short stories of Ernest Hemingway. This is the only place I've ever seen that. Um, ironically, it is not a complete story of Ernest Hemingway. But the reason I think why people all gravitate, the Hemingway connoisseurs all gravitate towards their own favorite special Hemingway is that when I speak to other Hemingway connoisseurs on Hills Like White Elephants, um, indelibly one of them will say, no, 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 no. Well, this is what this is about. Whereas when, when someone brings up um, the doctor and the doctor's wife. Boy, the doctor and the doctor's wife. What was that one? What was that one about? Well, let me tell you. Yeah. And I'll take yeah. your word for it, right? Yes. So I, I think that's one of the reasons, one of the the, the little things about uh, the Hemingway cult that is extremely interesting to me. And you know, there is uh, just speaking on Hemingway. There is a cult of following for Hemingway, as there should be. I don't I, even. I, cult suggests small. I, yes. I, it's a sh a shrine, maybe. It is its own religion, perhaps. Which you know, anyone who wants to be a writer, you have to explore Hemingway. Anyone who wants to be a reader, you have to experience Hemingway. Yeah. And I'm, I'm not saying pack up, move to Paris, and you know walk the streets. But maybe get a necklace with a, a Hemingway pendant on it. So like, <laughs> Whatever do, works. Do for it the religion way. Do right? you have a necklace with a Hemingway pendant? I refuse to answer that question. That's what I thought. <laughs> anyway, tell us what you like. Tell us what you didn't like. Uh, give us a follow on Facebook or maybe even Twitter. Uh, at stripped cover on Twitter. At stripped cover lit on Facebook. Make sure you subscribe to the YouTube channel. Maybe give us a thumbs up.